It's time for the 1430 Connection on 1430 WNAV and 99.9 FM. Spotlighting news, newsmakers, and important community issues. Now, with this week's edition of the 1430 Connection, here is WNAV news anchor Donna Cole. Welcome to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. Today I have the pleasure of speaking to Brian Belanger. He's the curator of the National Capital Radio and Television Museum in Bowie. It's on Mitchell Road. Brian, thank you very much for joining me today. Well, thank you for inviting me. And you were also the executive director of the museum for uh, almost a decade? In its early days, that's correct. What were the early days of the museum? Well, we opened our doors in 1999. Prior to that, uh, we had an organization that was trying to create this museum, and we had uh, temporary exhibits at public libraries in the area, at uh, one of the shopping malls in the area. Uh, We had uh, some longstanding exhibits at the George Washington University in downtown D.C., and then it was... uh, 1999, when we moved into our current building, which is owned by the city of Bowie. How did it start? Uh, There's a group here in the area called the Mid-Atlantic Antique Radio Club, a very active group of people who love old radios and radio history. Uh, It's been in existence for several decades. And uh, not too long after that club started, uh, several of us said, let's see if we can create a museum so we can share our interest in, in radio history with the general public. And so uh, we worked for quite a number of years before it actually took place. But we've been in Bowie now since 1999. And how did you get so involved? Uh, Your background was in electrical engineering? That's right. I'm an electrical engineer. I spent most of my career at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg. But I've always tinkered with radio since I was a kid. When the museum first started, uh, there were a number of us who volunteered to try to make it happen. And uh, it's been very successful. Uh, In fact, TripAdvisor says we're one of the 10 best museums in the state of Maryland, so that was very nice. So for anyone that wants more information on the museum, it's ncrtv.org. It's currently, you're currently closed right now because of the pandemic, yes? Yes, we closed because of the virus. We're hoping to be able to open up fairly soon, and uh, at least initially when we reopen, we'll probably be doing it on an appointment-only basis to keep the crowds down. It's a wonderful place to visit. It's free admission and free parking, and it's uh, really a nostalgia trip through the history of radio and TV if you come and visit there. The National Association of Broadcasters has dubbed this year the 100th anniversary of radio, but it's not really. What it is, is it might be the 100th anniversary of the first commercial broadcast. But even that's uh, kind of up for debate. And I'll, I'll read what the National Association of Broadcasters said to me about that. They said, thank you for reaching out last week about NAB's We Are Broadcasters Radio 100 campaign. As the news release indicates, we're referring to 100 years of commercial radio specifically. We acknowledge that there are many important milestones leading up to the first commercial radio broadcast, but en- every anniversary celebration needs a particular date to observe. And for the Radio 100 project, We felt the most widely recognized date was November 2nd, 1920. We see this as a great opportunity to remind policymakers and our listeners what makes radio different, the role we've played in shaping our country in the last 100 years, and how we continually adapt to serve listeners now and in the future. Well, yeah, there's a lot of debate about this, and and it depends on what criteria you use. In fact, the... uh, The issue of our uh, museum journal that just came out, we publish a quarterly journal, and the uh, September issue that just came out uh, has a lead article about uh, the 100th anniversary of KDKA. And the fact is there were... There were a number of what you might call experimental broadcasts, you know, well before KDKA came on the air. And those certainly are deserving of recognition, but uh, KDKA does get credit for being the the first station that really uh, got uh, what you might call national recognition for coming on with, uh, with regular entertainment broadcasting. And it's probably not correct to call it commercial broadcasting because actually radio commercials did not really start until a, a couple of years after that. Uh, the original radio stations generally did not sell commercials, and there were a number of a number of, I said, ex- experimental stations that you know came on before KDK, but but they it was usually maybe just on you know just very temporarily and not a, not a regular thing. Whereas once KDK came on in November 1920, they had then continued regular broadcasting from that point on. Let's take a short break. Let's come back and learn more about KDKA and how that happened. We'll be right back on the 1430 Connection. 
Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. My name is Donna Cole. Today I have the pleasure of talking to Brian Belanger. He's the curator of the National Capital Radio and Television Museum. We're talking about the 100th anniversary of the first commercial radio broadcast, although there's even there's questions about that, whether it's really commercials, because commercials weren't included in those broadcasts, yes? Westinghouse, of course, was the company that started that station, KDKA, and so uh, they, would, they would say things like, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, station KDKA in Pittsburgh uh, brought to you by the Westinghouse Electric Company, but they didn't, for example, really get into advertising products. Uh, if you go back and look at radio history, the station that is first credited with actually selling commercial time to uh, sponsors was station WEAF in New York. That was a station owned by the phone company, by AT&T. And, of course, AT&T had pay phones back in those days, so they got the bright idea of, well, if you have a radio station sort of like a pay phone, why don't you allow people to pay money to uh, say something over the radio? Right, makes and sense. So, uh, it was in the early 20s when the station WEAF actually began selling commercials, and some of the other stations around the, around the country thought that was really tacky, and there were editorials and radio magazines saying that this is, this is a terrible thing to allow advertising on the radio. It should be prohibited. But, of course, once they started doing it, then pretty soon everybody else was doing it, and before long it became the, the accepted way of doing business. And here we are in 2020. And still here we are. And, and yeah. thankfully, we've had a very vibrant radio uh, industry in this country ever since. KDKA is in Pittsburgh. How it was Dr. Frank Conrad, right, who was with Westinghouse, who right. ended up. Right, Conrad was. Yeah. Con- Conrad was one of their main engineers, a very talented guy, and he had a ham radio station. And so um, every evening when he finished work, he'd go home and turn on his ham station, and he had set it up so he could do voice communication with that. And in those days, uh, the restrictions on hams were much less strict than they are today. So uh, he could, you know, put on a phonograph record and broadcast phonograph record music over his ham station. And the other ham operators in the area would listen to that and thought it was pretty, pretty interesting. And so uh, then the Westinghouse Company was beginning to pay attention to that, and the management there said, you know, this conceivably could be a business opportunity uh, because they were wanting to sell radios to the general public. And so they said, if we started up a radio station that had some good contact that people would want to listen to, we could sell more Westinghouse radios to ordinary families. And so that's what they did. And so KDKA started up. It's been broadcasting ever since. Ever since, continuously. Not every day. Now, at first, they didn't broadcast every day of the week. Now, today, most radio stations are on 24-7, but in the early days, uh, radio stations were not necessarily on 24-7. In fact, most of them would, uh, you know, sort of some share time with other stations on the same frequency, uh, and almost all the stations went off the air about midnight and didn't come back on until the next morning in the early days. So if you listen in the middle of the night in the early days, it would be very rare to hear uh, any stations on the air. Now, at what point does the federal government get involved and say, we need to start making up some rules? <laughs> well, that's another interesting story. In the early days, uh, because uh, the earliest radios were used mainly for ship communication, uh, there was a time when the Bureau of Lighthouses actually regulated radio. <laughs> but then over the years, uh, it changed a number of times. The, the Department of Commerce uh, had responsibility for a number of years, and then there was the, uh, the Federal Radio Commission, which was the predecessor to the Federal Communications Commission. And so there were a number of different uh, laws passed over the years that regulated radio, and it was, uh, uh, you know, it was a question of, of how do you divide up the frequency spectrum uh, between the commercial stations and the military stations and the ham operators, and, uh, and that's evolved considerably over the, over the years uh, as things change. It's a continually changing, evolving thing, even though we've all been out there doing this for a very long time, yes? It doesn't stay constant. Well, that's right. And, uh, in fact, as we speak today, uh, because of the interest in uh, new cell phone systems, there's uh, looking at uh, on some of the very, very high frequencies, uh, you know, are we going to take spectrum away from some other users and give it to more cell phone usage? And, you know, those kinds of issues continue to come up. Let's take another short break. We'll be right back on the 1430 Connection. 
Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. My name is Donna Cole. I have the pleasure of speaking with Brian Belanger. He's the curator of the National Capital Radio and Television Museum on Mitchellville Road in Bowie, Maryland. Brian, why has radio lasted for so long? WNAV celebrated our 70th anniversary last year, and we're still going strong. We're still delivering the news, the weather, the traffic, the sports, and the music to Anne Arundel and Queen Anne's County. What I mean, what is it that keeps an AM radio station going strong for so many years? Well, you've obviously figured out what your listeners enjoy. And, uh, uh, you know, I think radio has evolved so much over the years. Of course, if you go back, like, to the 1930s uh, and you look at network radio in those days, it was, uh, you know, radio drama and comedy. I mean, you had shows like Jack Benny and Fibber McGee and Molly in the Lux Radio Theater, and so people would – sit around in their living rooms in the evening and, and listen to the dramas and the comedies and sports events and presidential speeches. And then television came along, and, of course, uh, more and more people were watching television in their living rooms instead of listening to the radio. So the radio stations had to scratch their heads and say, oh, what are we going to do now? And uh, many of them changed their formats. Uh, they went to things like Top 40 Hits or some became all news stations, some became all sports stations. Uh, so there was this, uh, this scramble to figure out how do we cope with this new environment and compete with television. And, you know, the stations that were successful figured out a way to do that, to provide content that their, their listeners uh, certainly wanted to tune in and listen to. You know what's amazing to me is that not a, a day goes by that we don't get many calls from listeners, whether it's for contest or it's for uh, traffic information. Hey, what's happening on 97? We need to know. We get calls when, when the weather is bad. Are the schools closed? There are so many people that depend on the radio for their sources of information and for a friendly voice in their homes or in their cars. Or I guess we're part of people's families. Well, and I think a station like WNAV uh, is successful because it has that local connection. Um, one of the things that is, is pretty dramatic is, you know, when I was a kid growing up years ago, most radio stations were locally owned and operated, and, uh, you know, the, the radio station would broadcast the high school football games and that sort of thing and, you know, local news. And then in recent years, uh, there are those large corporations that have been buying up radio stations all over the country. So... It's not uncommon, you know, to be driving across the country and you go from city to city and you hear the same exact program coming from New York or Hollywood or something and, and all these stations. And I think I, I kind of miss the fact that there aren't as many of the local radio stations there used to be that, that give you that local connection. Yeah, there sure aren't. There's not as many. And the, what, what, exactly as you just said, a lot of what we hear is uh, satellite. It's homogenized. It sounds the same in Seattle as it does in New York for some people driving through Annapolis. There is an emergency uh, aspect to radio, though, that, I mean, you see as a ham operator also that if the proverbial blank hits the fan and sure. we lose satellites and we lose internet we still have the ability to broadcast well that's right and uh, and uh, you know I mean whenever there's a national crisis what is the first thing everybody do? you turn on your radio do you turn on your TV if there's a crisis to find out what's going on right and uh, you know that's still critically important is it true that the pilots depend on the you know at the top of the hour or the bottom of the hour you'll hear a radio station saying from the 1430 WNAV newsroom in Annapolis. Well, I think I think there there's some of that still going on and uh uh interestingly enough uh, back in the in the Cold War era there was a system called Conrad where uh the concern was that bombers were going to come Russian bombers were going to come over the North Pole to attack the United States and of course there was no GPS in those days so if you wanted to find your target how did you do it? One of the ways people did it was to use radio direction finding. So, for example, uh, if, if the Russians, and of course they would know that, the Russians would know that there was a station in Annapolis, WNAV, and what frequency you were on. And so if they were even flying through, a, flying through a fog, they could use their direction finders to zero in on your transmitter and fly right into Annapolis or Washington, D.C. And so this system called Conrad, uh, Control of Electromagnetic Radiation, was uh, set up so that in time of a national crisis, all the radio stations were supposed to go off the air except for a few that were authorized to stay on, and they would switch 
every few minutes between stations so that the Russians wouldn't be able to zero in on <laughs> any one particular station. That's and one of the exhibits we have right now at our museum is we have one of those old Conrad receivers, which all the radio stations were required to have back in those days. I wouldn't be surprised if there was some uh, back in or one of our back rooms at the station. In you our probably have room. one up in the attic somewhere. <laughs> probably do, yeah. I, the, the thing about the, the call letters, I had heard that if the cockpit, whatever electronics go down, this is the way pilots can still reference where they're at, where they're over. Some of the more interesting pieces that you've come across over the years that you've been at the museum, what, what are some of your favorites? Well, we actually have some very rare items at the museum. Uh, it's really worth a trip to come and see them. We actually have two scanning disc television sets from 1931. One was a kit set and one was a factory-built set. In those days, um, they didn't use electronic television with picture tubes. When they first started with television in the late 20s, they had what was called mechanical scanning disc, where you'd have a motor-driven disc with a little uh, spiral of holes punched in and a bright light behind it that would create the moving image. Mm -hmm. And those are extremely rare, and we actually, actually have two of those on display. We have, uh, we have of course, hundreds and hundreds of, of radios uh, uh, dating from the very earliest, uh, you know, and we even have a satellite radio now, but we have, uh, you know, lots of radios like from the 20s, 30s, and 40s. We have an example of the first transistor radio. We have an example of uh, something called a Crosley Rido, which is like a fax machine that delivered newspapers to the home by radio back in the late 30s. Huh. You, could, you could buy one of these machines, hook it up to your radio, and in the night when everybody is sound asleep, this long strip of paper would print out like a fax machine, and uh, radio stations would, would uh, essentially broadcast a newspaper over the air. How cool is that? Yeah, oh, well. and uh, we, we, have, uh, we have an example of the first radio with a uh, wireless remote control, a 1939 Philco. It looked like a big wooden box with a telephone dial on it. You could select the station from your easy chair, and it had a wireless uh, control to operate the radio. And that's, you know, that's how we can actually demonstrate that for people. So there's lots and lots of very rare and interesting uh, artifacts if you come and visit there. And if you come and visit, I'll give you the VIP tour. I, well, you, I will definitely take you up on that. It is on my list of things to do, and I'm sorry I haven't done it already. For the listeners out there, it's N as in November, C as in Charlie, R as in radio, T as in television, and V.org, ncrtv.org on the Internet. And the museum will be opening back up shortly after being closed because of this pandemic we've had. Brian, any idea when that's going to happen? Well, we're discussing that right now. Of course, uh, the building we're in is owned by the city of Bowie, so we're going to be following whatever restrictions the city of Bowie has in place at any given time, and also uh, Prince George's County. So uh, we're watching that very carefully, and we're hoping it'll be fairly soon we'll be able to reopen. Thank you so much for your time today. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for inviting me. This is Donna Cole on the 1430 Connection. We will see you next week. 